this gives me a great pleasure to have um, Agus uh, as a speaker for this talk. Agus is somebody I really admire, uh, long time uh, uh, interactions. Uh, I would say going all the way, maybe 20 years back in time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he spent his uh, career uh, and developed his career, I should say, doing work in uh, disease screening and uh, understanding disease progression uh, through a variety of di different methodologies. He is uh, highly decorated at uh, Madison at this point. Uh, and we were just joking how to introduce him uh, for the webinar. But I would, and he basically joked saying that, well, I'll just look him up on Google. So yes, go ahead, look him up on Google. Uh, he has done all sorts of things in uh, like particularly in this area of uh, oncology. Uh, so with that, Agus, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Sanjay. Really, it's an honor to be actually introduced by you. Really appreciate your kind introduction. Uh, first, thank you very much to the organizers for considering me to, you know, disseminate my work, share my, you know, opinions and maybe latest research results. So, uh, I mean, I am going to like close the Zoom window so I cannot see or like see the chat window. So you guys just like anytime you want to stop me, just like jump in and raise your voice. I don't mind being interrupted. So. And with that, let me start the, uh, the, my, my today's presentation. So today I'm going to talk about, as Sanjay said, over the last 15 years, I've been working on this using stochastic modeling, especially to individualize disease screening, mostly in oncology, but uh, this is really applicable to other diseases too, decisions. So I want to talk about, you know, maybe one major research project that we did almost like 10 years ago, but then how we extended in our recent work. Now, of course, those of you who are in academia know that none of this work is possible if you don't have, you know, good collaborators and smart students. And I was very fortunate to work with really amazing students and amazing collaborators. I will say the first four, four of them are my former PhD students. They are all informs members, so you may probably know them. And these are my clinical collaborators. Uh, only Yakovas, I actually saw Yakovas, who is luckily he's also here, so he can correct me if I mess up anything. And he is an informs member among my other, you know, clinical collaborators. So this is really, again, a combination of 15 years of work uh, with, you know, working with these amazing people. Maybe I will take the credit today, but really the credit belongs to everybody who contributed to this work. Now, let me start with the motivation. And again, as I said, although this is applicable to other diseases, this framework, uh, I am primarily focusing on cancer oncology, and I'm guessing and I'm going to go a little quickly here that you are agreeing with me, that you agree with me that cancer is a big deal. You know, we are like almost 40% of the people have a lifetime risk of developing cancer. Mortality is high. It's a, it's a big deal in the US and other places. Now, one thing about cancer, and this is true for many other diseases, is early detection saves lives significantly, okay? Just from an example from colon cancer, if you catch the disease in stage three, the survival rate, 10 year survival is 52%, half of the patients die. Whereas, you know, if you catch it in stage one, only 10% of the people, less than 10% of the people die. And these statistics are actually getting better and better thanks to advancements in treatments. So the, as you can imagine, this has been discovered 30, 40 years ago, people are like, okay, if you wanna make people live longer, we have to diagnose this disease early. But the problem is these diseases are not symptomatic. So you don't know whether the patient has colon cancer unless you do some, you know, screening. Screening meaning, you know, a technology that is going to detect asymptomatic, you know, patients. And as a result, there is a lot of improvements in different areas. So for breast cancer, there is a lot of technology. Every two, three years, something is coming up. There is something, you know, a controversial in prostate, colorectal, it's a very dynamic area, same with lung cancer. So there is all these screening technologies. And uh, this is great. So we can do, let's say, mammography, and we can uh, do mammography screening to every woman in the US, and we catch all the diseases early, and then we save lives. But the problem is, while you do the screening, screening, especially aggressive screening, also leads to some what we call harms. Uh, 
clearly in colonoscopy. I mean, colonoscopy is not fun, but like during colonoscopy, if there is bleeding, perforation, and other things, actually some patients may die, you know, due to colonoscopy. Very rare, but it happens. And for some others, like in uh, PSH screening or even in some breast cancer screening, false positive rates are so high that you are basically jeopardizing the quality of the life of the patients. People are highly anxiety and there is a lot of cost. So this is the basic idea. I mean, the basic idea of my research over, over the last 15 years is, okay, there is these benefits and there is these harms. And we really need to do this trade-off in a more formal framework. And that is what I am going to talk today, like especially partial absorbed microdistribution processes is really my methodological uh, interest in this line of work. And I actually believe, and I actually, I think we demonstrated over the last 15 years, me and many others, you know, amazing people at informs that POMDPs could actually be used to answer all these questions of when should we start screening, what age, what should we end, how often should we do it, annual, biennial, triennial, or whatever, and whom to screen, high risk, low risk, and, and so on and so on. So what I'm going to do in the rest of my talk today is I will use mammography screening for breast cancer as an example for how we develop these POMDPs, and then I will talk about some recent extensions in breast cancer screening, as well as other you know, cancer models and how they are different and what is interesting in them. And that's where I am hoping to talk about colorectal cancer and lung cancer screening work. Okay. Let's start with uh, you know, breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer is unfortunately quite common. One in eight women in the US are going to experience some you know, breast cancer throughout their lifetime. Lots of deaths, lots of cases, okay? It's a big deal. And similar to other cancers, you know, if you detect it very late in distant stage, five-year survival is 27%. Early stage, five-year survival is 98%. You basically make these people live like, like other women without, you know, breast cancer. And uh, almost in, uh, I will say 1982 is when US first started sort of introducing mammography to practice. And there were a lot of clinical trials, still some trials that showed that uh, on large numbers of women that it actually reduces mortality. And it is fast, $140, according to latest Medicare reimbursement available. And lots of studies show that it's cost effective. So mammography is great. If we do mammography to women uh, and we can catch their cancer, even when it is less than a centimeter, you know, a, a few millimeters. Okay, so that's great. Now. Like other you know, screen tests, mammography is also trouble. Uh, yes, there is some small pain, but the big deal is false positives. People are very worried about false positives because if you tell a woman that you have an abnormal mammography, she's immediately thinking, oh, you know, I have cancer. So you know, she's crushed, her fa family, relatives, everybody is crushed. And then it takes a few months, at least several weeks, a few months, a lot of follow-up tests to figure out that whether it is indeed cancer or not. And an increasing concern is there is a lot of what we call overdiagnosis, especially for ductal carcinoma inside a sort of less invasive version of the cancer where people are thinking maybe some of these tumors that we find and treat, they will never kill the woman. And this is really more common in other cancers like in thyroid cancer. Now, if false positives are rare, who cares, right? If only one out of 100 positive tests are ending up false positive, I don't care, right? It's worth the benefit. But the problem even with mammography is, which is relatively a you know, good test is it's not very rare. So considering sensitivity of the specificity of the test for the specificity 93%, you can make the very simple math that after 10 mammograms, and that's what like American College of Radiology recommends you the annual mammography starting at age you know, 40, by age 50, there is a 50% chance you're going to experience a false positive. 20% chance you're going to have an unnecessary biopsy. So this is a big deal. And, and this sort of false positives not being common is the reason that people are looking into, you know, okay, mammography screening is great, but maybe we should, you know, plan it carefully. Now, one thing that I am, like, as I am looking into interesting problems in healthcare and medicine, you know, what's an interesting problem for an OR person? I'm always looking into, you know, okay, what do the experts without any math model are telling about this decision or this policy? And then if I see that there is like huge disagreement uh, among different bodies, uh, these are all smart, super smart people. 
Then I'm like, okay, maybe there's an opportunity for a math model here because if they are all agreeing that, oh, we should do screening this age, that age, and no controversies, there is little you can improve the practice. But when I we look into this sort of mammography screen problem, one thing you notice is I'm basically seeing most major medical organizations in the US, as you can see, they all have different recommendations. Maybe some, you know, we start at page 40, 45, 50, every one year, every two years. Maybe we should stop at age 74. I don't have the numbers here. Sometimes 69, 79. Sometimes they say that if the life expectancy is less than 10 years, we should stop, you know, mammography screening. So, so much controversy. The other thing is you may look into other countries and, you know, uh, this is mostly for developed countries, right? And as we can see from this table, even, you know, it's not that the societies and um, are, are very different in terms of their breast cancer risk or prospects, but really the way that they interpret data and they trade off these harms and benefits of mammography screening, they disagree. They, again, as you can see, there is, I will say the least aggressive is the UK 50 to 70 every three years and US is probably, and I visited Singapore, so I checked them out, that's why Singapore is here, uh, is like they are actually having the most sort of, I will say, aggressive screening among others. And they, you know, charge a fee, which is from an old time. So anyway, so these data, you know, indicate that there is some opportunity here, okay? Now, when I first started this work, like when we first started working both breast and colorectal back in like 2008, I was really not thinking about, oh, we can do this, you know, based on different patients, but I was really thinking, okay, what is the optimal starting and ending age? And let's do this for everybody. But then as we read more and more about, we figure this out that, you know, it's actually, you know, whenever these guidelines say, oh, you know, start at age four and age 74, that is really, relatively a dumb way, uh, not a smart way of, you know, recommending screening because we know that every woman has a different risk, similar to any other diseases. And there is a ton of research on for colorectal cancer, for, for lung cancer, right? I mean, like somebody who is smoking versus not smoking. I mean, if you can, if you only make your recommendation based on age and ignore the smoking history, that is somewhat not smart, right? Same with breast cancer. There's so many risk factors. We know about them. If somebody has a family history, they are like two times more likely to get cancer compared to someone who doesn't have a family history of breast cancer. So it just doesn't make any sense to tell these women you gotta go undergo the same screening schedule. Okay. So as we read the literature and you know interacted with medical folks, we noticed that okay, you know what, this personalization could be the key rather than just writing another article doing another study saying, oh, optimal is 50, 74 every two years or whatever, let's focus on this personalized aspect. And, and that was the basic motivation of this whole POMDP. And because when you look into these single starting age, ending age question and frequency, you are missing this whole story that the people have different risks and maybe they have different screening histories. People are not fully adherent to guidelines. And if you look into screening history, you may come up with a more tailored decision. Now, as I always say, I'm not like, the, <laughs> um, fortunately, there are too many smart people on the earth, and I'm not the first one to think about this, you know, personalization, IOM, this is not National Academy of Medicine, back in 2005, they said that we have to go with individualized screening strategies, and this is for breast cancer, but this is really the case for other cancers. Here. So that was the basic idea. So everybody's talking about, in medical world, everybody's talking about uh, personalized screening. And I actually do some work with some of these policymakers like US Preventive Services Task Force. And they also are aware of that we should go with individual screening. The problem is nobody has a framework to implement a individualized screening framework. Because when you consider if I have, let's say seven risk factors, some of them are like two, three levels, we are talking about like hundreds of different combinations of risk factors and hundreds of different thousands of different options with respect to age and starting age, ending age frequency. So we have to come up with a relatively simpler uh, representation of this individualization. And that is the basic idea of POMDP, okay? And there is a lot of work in breast cancer screening, but really uh, this sequence is probably the first one that focuses on personalization, okay? 
Okay, are you guys with me? I am. Okay, let me open the video and see that you guys are still with me. Any questions so far? Oh, I'm speaking quite fast, right? No? Okay. Uh, I will continue that. So uh, now, many of you probably, I mean, this is informed community, many of you heard of MDP, POMDP sort of methods, but let me give my sort of 30 second uh, description of what is a POMDP. So a POMDP is, you know, a controlled Markov process where we allow incomplete state information, okay? So we have an underlying Markov chain, let's say the three states, zero, one, and two, and an MDP, you look into the underlying Markov chains system state, whether we are in zero, one, or two, and then we make an optimization. But in real world, life is not that clear, right? We don't know whether our system is in zero, one, or two. Instead, we have this complex system where instead of having perfect knowledge about zero, one, and two, I have observations about the system. And based on that observations, I have this Bayesian idea, or I can believe, right? I have a belief about the true underlying condition. And I make a decision based on these beliefs. Okay, so that's the basic idea of a POMDP in a numnet, you know, way. And I'm gonna get into some equations here. Okay, so as we are modeling uh, this as sort of um, now we are talking about breast cancer, but again the same framework could be extended. And I will show you how we extend it to other cancers and other situations. We assume that you have a physician-patient making a decision jointly, and the objective is maximizing quality just of life risk. Kali's is people within the healthcare world are very familiar that Kali's are commonly used uh, to combine quantity and quality of life, okay? We assume that these decisions are made every six months at this period time. And we assume that every six months, the patient and the physician makes, oh, whether we do a mammogram today or we defer the screen decision for another six months. And this is where our state transition diagrams and underlying Markov chains occur. So as you can see, I have this zero, one, and two, no cancer, in situ cancer and invasive cancer. These are my partial observable states, right? Because at the time of making a screening decision, I don't know whether the patient has cancer. And by the way, we differentiate in situ and invasive cancer because there is a lot of controversy on uh, should we even treat in situ cancers? Should we, they have different treatments, different management. So physicians want to know not only the risk of cancer, but also want to know whether it's a risk of in situ versus invasive cancer. Invasive is more, more fatal. But at the time of decision, I only know whether, you know, the patient, uh, I mean, I don't know whether the patient has no cancer, then why would I do screening? But I, instead I have a belief whether the patient has uh, in a no, no cancer state, in situ cancer state or invasive cancer state. So these are my partial observable states. If the patient dies throughout this process, it's completely observable. Similarly, the cancer could be detected at an in situ or an invasive stage and then treatment start and decision ends for us. We are not worried about, um, you know, post cancer diagnosis states for this model, okay? And again, instead of, oh, my system state being zero, one, and two, I have this belief, let's say, I, 0 0.9, 0 0.07, 0 0.03 means that there's a 90% chance the patient is no cancer, 7% chance in situ cancer, and 3% chance patient has invasive cancer, okay? So I'm going to make my decisions based on these beliefs, okay? That's the basic idea. And now, how am I going to build these beliefs? Yes, I can look into some overall risk of the patient using individualized risk factors. But I can also have some observations, right? Like every time a patient comes for a mammogram and whether the mammogram is positive or negative, I have a belief update, right? Because if it is a negative mammography, that doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have four cancer because mammography may miss some cancers, but that reinforces my belief that, or oh, maybe this patient doesn't have cancer. More likely that this patient is gonna be in the no cancer state. Even after a weight action, suppose I don't make any uh, a mammography uh, actions, there is a possibility that the patient may have a palpable lump in her own breast and then come for a physical exam or at the physical exam in the clinical breast exam, it was detected to be a palpable lump and then they recommend mammography. So even if we don't do mammography, we still receive these observations that gives us some idea about updating our beliefs. And observation properties are the likelihood that the, the, the patient has cancer and likelihood that it is going to be a false negative or a false positive or, and, and so on and so on. 
And state transition properties have these sort of underlying Markov chain uh, st states change over time. And again, we are looking into Kali's, okay? So this is somewhat a simplified decision diagram that we are looking into. And suppose, you know, uh, I am looking into, you know, mammography decision for a patient where I have a belief state of BT at time T. Should I do mammography or not? And my optimal objective function value, VT star BT, is current colleagues within the next six months plus future colleagues. And I'm going to update my belief six months later based on my observations. And uh, for example, if I have a 97 and 3%, suppose I say I'm going to get a mammography, okay? And uh, or the patient is going to get a mammography and the patient's mammography is a negative mammography. Then as you can see, I'm going to update my belief state about the patient's risk of cancer. And as you can see, it's increased from 90% to 98%. It's not 100% because again, maybe mammography was a false negative or maybe the patient developed a completely new cancer in the next six months. So this basically is how I am updating my beliefs about the patient's risk of cancer, risk of no cancer, insight to cancer and invasive cancer, okay? Now, uh, if you wanna get into further math, you know, this is sort of what we call the optimality equations, right? And the optimality equations are your maximizing total expected colleagues. This is the value associated with the taking action weight. And this is the value associated with the taking action mammography. And this is a, uh, mammography with a negative outcome, mammography with a pulse positive outcome, and mammography with a true positive outcome. And as you can see, when true positive happens, I give this lump sum reward that is post-diagnosis life expectancy, qualitative life expectancy for the patient. This is relatively a simple, it seems like a simple set of equations, right? But the concern here is that, first of all, as you can see, this VT is related to VT star, and VT star has this Bayesian updated function. So it's somewhat a complex form. The other problem is this B is a continued state space. Right? If I am really obsessed with solving this optimality, which I am, unfortunately, so I still say it for that. But uh, if you're obsessed with, oh, I don't want to do this like approximation. I want to do like perfectly optimal policy for every possible belief. We, are, we have infinitely many belief states, right? So that's a problem. So uh, that's why we need to do something innovative. And this is probably one of the reasons I was also very attracted to this problem because application was, it is cool, but there is this interesting theoretical challenge that, you know, how do you solve this? Now, again, fortunate to so many smart people, I'm not the first one to identify POMDPs. And there are actually people who came up with ideas to for, for solving these POMDPs. And the first idea is the following. This is again, yes, we made the proof for our problem. But this was uh, proven for a generalized POMD, a different type of POMD before in 1973 and 1978 with Smollett and Sondek, okay? So, and, and here what we prove is we prove that, okay, the optimal value functions piecewise linear and convex, okay? This is cool because once it is piecewise linear and convex, you can basically represent the optimal value function as a, you know, a, as a combination of, as a convex combination of like a, a, using a bunch of hyperplanes, a finite number of hyperplanes, which is great. So in order to characterize the optimal value function, all I need to know for this example problem is one, two, three, four. If I know these four vectors, I am all set. I don't need to know every single point's optimal value function and action. As far as I know these fours, I can characterize the optimal value function, which is great, okay? But the problem is, if you say you want to go with this idea from one iteration to another, if you do backward induction type of an algorithm, the number of such finite number of hyperplanes increase exponentially. Too many of them exist. So the basic idea of the solution algorithms is let's remove these unnecessary combinations of the uh, what we call alpha vectors so that we will only identify the, these red ones, okay? So that's the basic idea of the solution algorithm. And this is where we did some, uh, I will say additional innovation numerically to be able to eliminate these things, okay? Now, we also proved, I mean, at least in the first paper, I mean, I'm a big fan of MDPs from DPs because it not only tells you, oh, here is the solution, but it also gives you some insight on, you know, what is some 
uh, analytical insights that you can provide to the policymakers and you know for for the decision makers. I mean, we prove certain things. These are not very, I would say, strong theorems, or they are not quite impressive proofs either. But at least you know they gave us some you know confirmation or modeling is somewhat robust because we prove certain intuitive things. So basically, this one proves that okay, the value function should increase if I have a low risk patient, lower risk patient. Okay, that's what this proves. And this one is interesting because this one is basically saying that, okay, if you prove, uh, uh, if, you, if you know that there is a mammography action optimality for a particular patient, another patient who has a higher risk of cancer must have mammography as the optimal action. That is what this theorem proves. And we see that in our numerical results. So we, we make these proofs again, uh, to help us that, okay, can be analytically show some of these, I will say intuitive insights, okay? Anyway, so I'm going to skip that. Now I will get into the more exciting stuff, which is numerical results, okay? Now, uh, as I told you, you know, my first obsession, when it's an optimization model, unless, you know, I have no other option, I want to solve it to the exact optimality. My second obsession is let's solve this using real life data. I don't like to sit down on my table generate some, you know, uh, simulated data, synthetic data, and, you know, do run some experiments. I, I respect that too, which is fine, but at least for my personal, uh, you know, choice, at least in the healthcare domain, uh, I feel like if I want to have credibility to do my medical collaborators, to my healthcare, you know, audience, I have to go with real life at most, as much as possible. Suppose, you know, you want to solve this using real life data. Well, how about do you need? Your first need is, I need to know this post-cancer life expectancy estimations. This is available. There is SEER surveillance epidemiology and results database from NCI. They collected, they reported since 1975. So amazing data, you can estimate. The second one is, I want to know if the patient does not die of breast cancer, what is likely that the patient dies from non-breast cancer causes. You can also find them from life tables. Quality of life scores, I need to know utility of the patient towards mammography, false positive biopsy, so on and so on. That's available in the literature. Now, uh, observation probabilities are basically, what is the likelihood that if the patient has cancer, I missed it, or if the patient doesn't have cancer and I basically come up with a false positive mammography. So that's also available in the literature, lots of data. But two pieces of information is troubled, right? The first one is, okay, what if I missed the cancer and the patient has cancer, I didn't do screening, what is the likelihood that the patient is gonna die or Suppose the patient has inside the cancer now and I didn't detect it. What is the likelihood that this, this inside the cancer is going to become invasive within the next six months? Now, as you can imagine, this data is not easily possible, you know, available. You can't find any literature or any studies that report this unless you live in a very fascist regime. You know, you're not going to tell women that, oh, you know, I'm going to keep you, oh, women, you have insight to cancer, I will let you die, and I'm going to collect your data for the sake of science, and then I can estimate this probability. but luckily we are not living in a regime like that, and, you know, we don't want to have any data like that, right, so, but this is a problem, if I want to, if I'm obsessed in solving this, you know, problem using uh, real data, then I need this data, I need the data for cancer progression, and this is where, uh, I mean, Many of my colleagues at Informs actually don't know. I have this dark side or like the double life, my second life in another world, which is in NCI. I am member and I am actually PI of the uh, what we call a cancer intervention surveillance modeling network funded by NCI. So this is, it's called CISNET. So CISNET is, uh, you know, uh, NCI actually, and I, you know, the, came up with this vision in 2000, before 2000, they started funding these groups in 2000, they basically said, you know what, in order to answer some important plus can breast cancer or cancer policy decisions, we need to invest in modeling. And the way that they are doing modeling, and I'm not going to get into too much detail, is mostly simulation, maybe a few analytical models, but mostly simulation models that represent disease progression and so on and so forth. So I am the PI for University of Wisconsin Breast Cancer Simulation Model. We are part of CISNET, okay? And the way that CISNET works is, NCI provides some common inputs and they tell these models in breast, we have six models. Uh, and basically they tell, make your assumptions about the natural of the history of the disease and generate these outputs to us. Mostly SEER reported, age adjusted, 
breast cancer incidence and mortality by, by stage over the years. And it was cross-validated against trials. I mean, think about it. this has been funded since 2000. NSA invested at least the 20, 30 million dollars on just breast cancer models. So it's a huge investment. These are quite complex models. I wouldn't say like not math complex, but very tedious. Uh, our code is C++ 25,000 lines of code, and it, it, it is very complex, okay? But the CISNET is, and, and just to not to show up, but also to tell you that this is quite influential group is when we write a paper, and this is some of the news coverage from our papers where we have like 15 authors, 20 authors. Uh, it's basically big news. It appears in CNN, NBC, all these big places because this group is highly respected, and you know, and it provided evidence, you know, for actual policy recommendations. U.S. preventive services testers every seven, eight years work with us with press, and it also works with lung cancer team, colorectal cancer team to come up with guidelines. So basically, we are helping to set the guidelines in the U.S. So this is a quite robust model, and I am telling you this all this because. This is the model which has a very detailed natural history model that we use to estimate those progression probabilities. So it's not like I sit down and just like make some estimations in two months. This is a 20 year effort, okay? Now, uh, once we have this data, great. I have the cancer progression and other things. One other piece of information is my belief. Suppose a woman comes into the clinic and tells me, okay, I am 45 years old and, and tell me what am I gonna do? I need to know what is her belief state, right? What is the risk score of her? There is a lot of risk assessment models, we call them. The most famous one is Gale model developed by NCI, used by primary care physicians 20, 30,000 times a day. And this is how it is looking like, okay? So if you go to uh, NCI's website, I didn't check, to be honest, you know, in the last one year, I'm assuming it's still the similar. Uh, and there are other, I actually have better, you know, uh, more favorite uh, assessment tools, but this one is really the most popular one. You enter the risk factors of the patient, and then this um, Gale model tells you what is the risk of cancer for this woman, uh, and what is the risk of the average risk woman, okay? So this is what we use to estimate our initial belief point. And once you estimate the initial belief point, you can basically use the cancer progression rates to update it, okay? Now, this is our optimal policy for a 40-year-old patient. On the x-axis is risk of in-situ cancer. On the y-axis is risk of invasive cancer. This is the weight action. This is the mammography action. And if your belief is, let's say, just to give you an idea, if this is my risk factors, I enter the Gale model, and I estimate that my belief point is here, that means this patient should have a mammogram, OK? And this is theorem three, by the way. Now, if you look into age effect, we see that for 50-year-old, weight region enlarges, 60-year-old enlarges further, 70-year-old enlarges further, which basically means that as the patients get older, the optimal region for uh, mammography is actually getting smaller and smaller. And this is primarily due to two reasons. Cancer, there are like three reasons. Cancer is less aggressive in older women. Secondly, mammography is way more accurate in older women. This is actually working in the reverse order, but the most importantly, older women have limited life expectancies and comorbidities. As a result, their benefits from aggressive mammography screening is not as high as the younger women. Now, on the other hand, uh, if you look into, uh, just to show you this idea of dynamic policy, for a 40-year-old, suppose this is a low-risk woman, and suppose I don't do mammography, I update my belief, assuming that she doesn't have any self-detections, her next screening is going to be at age 43. And then the next screening is going to be age 40. So instead of saying every year, every two years, the way that we suggest we should be implementing this policy, this idea is personalization is we should have dynamic screening policy to improve the outcomes, okay? Now, if you look into the effect of age on the screening interval, as you can see for 40 year old, it is every five years, 55 year old every two years, 70 every six is probably 76 is the last screening age year. And this may sound counterintuitive because I already told you that as women get older, we are going to have less mammography actions in the optimal region. But what happens as women get older is cancer is becoming highly prevalent. Most of the cancers occur after actually age 55. So as a result, yes, the region for choosing mammography action gets smaller. 
but I am going to actually choose it more often. Okay. This is the optimal screen, screening frequencies for average risk women. Okay. And uh, as you can see, most screening is in this age. And then we said, let's compare this to the guidelines. Okay. Now compared to no screening, this is our personalized policy savings. Compared to most aggressive screening recommendation in GS4 to 74 every year, we are saving almost 20 mammograms per woman, almost like two false positives and uh, a few months. Okay, but think about that this is, we're talking about maybe 4 to 50 million of women. Compared to test force, actually, we are somewhat comparable, which is interesting, but our color savings are higher. Okay. Now, uh, one other thing that we always looked into, and this is actually interesting to consider in colorectal cancer, but not in mammography screening, uh, breast cancer screening, is screening history. We basically said, okay, well, suppose I have two patients, one never got any screening, the other one started screening at age 15 every two years. Should we do the same policy for these two women? This is my belief. This is cumulative risk of breast cancer. And as you can see, there's a huge discrepancy in terms of my belief on whether these women should be, you know, do they have cancer or not, okay? And based on that, I'm going to make a screen recommendation. Okay, so in conclusion, this work, we published this in 2012, I believe this was really, you know, a, a good first analytical framework to personalize mammography screening. And we said, you can use this belief state as a statistic to, you know, personalize, and then we can do optimization using POMDPs. And we found that personalized signaling has a lot of promise and it's promising. Then what did we do? Okay. Now I'm going to talk about a little more about my recent work. We, and, you know, so the first thing that we looked into in this line of work is we said, okay, uh, did, do we have, you know, what, what is the most limiting assumption as we are recommending personalization? The first thing is adherence, right? We are assuming that uh, women are going to follow my mathematical models recommendations religiously. But you know, if you look into data, that's not the case. I mean, even with so much recommendations on screening, only 55 to 60% of the women are uh, following the guidelines. So basically we said, you know what, let's do, since we are doing this personalization, let's do this personalization considering the non-adherence of the women. So instead of having just the risk of the cancer uh, in my belief state, I had a secondary belief state and now, I am looking into whether this woman is going to be a regular or an irregular screening. And there is a possibility of no show up. Every time the patient does not show up mammography screen, I can update about this woman's, this woman's behavior on whether she's a regular or an irregular screening. And this is relatively, you know, different from DP. It's the two, you know, independent states or partial observable states. And, but we, I think we found some interesting things. And uh, I, I mean, I presented this in some of the international cancer meetings, which was, you know, at least liked by the American Cancer Society. We basically found that if you have these low risk patients, uh, mostly, uh, you know, many patients, but if they have high adherence, like highly educated women, they typically have very high adherence to screening. Basically, if you tell them you need to undergo screening every year, you're actually penalizing them. They shouldn't be recommended very frequent screening. Whereas if you have high risk patients, okay, and they have low adherence, we should take to the aggressive under, we should make them aggressive under the mammography screening and encourage them to do every year screening. So basically when you make a policy recommendation, and this was at this, I never communicated directly with US Preventative Services Task Force, but as they are making recommendations, they gotta highlight this aspect, uh, um, especially so that women understand that, you know, the guidelines may, they typically assume that people are highly adherent, full, full perfectly adherent, but normally you, when you consider the adherence rate, the guidelines should be actually tailored to the adherence behavior of the women, okay? So this was the first extension we did. We looked into the adherence. And then in a other study, we basically looked into the capacity constraints. And, you know, it, it, that is our life, right? Like we are the informed community. We live in a constraint where the many decisions in healthcare when we do like cost effectiveness and this competitive effectiveness, we rarely talk about capacity. But capacity is a big deal, okay? Especially, uh, I mean, in a dramatic case, this is for mostly developing countries or I don't like develop, developing countries, uh, you know, framework, but at least the countries that are uh, increasingly becoming wealthier and are starting uh, a cancer screen program. I looked into the case of China, you know, as the country got the richer uh, and there was no mammography screen and China 
uh, I knew that we heard that once to start a you know a population based mammography screening strategy, we looked into not the cost, not the dollars. Yes, maybe the government could put the dollars, but we looked into uh, the radiologists as a capacity constraint. If let's say China went with the UK policy every two years, three years screening, they would have needed 25,000 radiologists. Whereas the country at the time I checked the literature had 50,000 radiologists. And I'm talking about 25,000 radiologists just breast cancer statistic. So the question is, let's say if a country like China, okay, uh, it's gonna take us some time until we reach full capacity. US underwent the same procedure from 1982 to almost mid nineties, it took them to build the capacity. So the question is, how am I going to allocate my limited capacity? So suppose I have, you know, only three mammograms per woman. Should I screen only high-risk women, or should I screen everybody? But I should screen them less, you know. And this is what we did. So we basically put put a constraint into our uh, MDP, and then we converted that constraint MDP into an MILP. Did some grid-based approximation and solved it. Okay. And then what we found in the end is with this article is even under very strict resource constraints, you know, countries that are interested in starting a screening program, they should not just say, oh, I have very limited capacity. So I will only screen high risk women very frequently, like every two years, three years, whatever. Instead, they should allocate some resources to screen average risk women and reduce the frequency of the screen for some high risk women. And then we also found that if let's say they have further capacity you know, limitations, patients in the 40, 49 age group should be the, you know, uh, given less least priority. Of course, this is US data. Every country has different epidemiological data, okay? Now, a very recent, this article appeared, I think just like a month ago. And uh, this one here, we looked into the following question. You know, uh, now we started with this breast cancer, but to me, this is uh, applicable to every multi, you know, chronic conditions. There are uh, chronic conditions are super common, right? Like almost uh, two thirds of Americans have some chronic conditions over age 60, 65. And there are some chronic conditions, they affect the risk of developing cancer, treatments received, expected life years, all that stuff. And perfect example is diabetes and breast cancer. Diabetes, there is data shows that increased risk for postmenopausal women. Cancer cells, they love sugar. So, you know, diabetes women have 30% higher risk of breast cancers, which means you should screen them more aggressively, right? But due to comorbidities, they cannot get the same treatment. So they receive less adjuvant chemotherapy due to toxicity. That also means that if you receive less treatment, screening is actually more valuable. There is typically a negative synergy between advancements in treatments and screening. So then that means that they should be getting, again, more aggressive screening. But on the other hand, they have all these comorbidities, their life years, almost seven, eight years shorter expected life is compared to women without diabetes. So the question is maybe, you know, we may be doing overdiagnosis when we aggressively screen them. So the question is, what is the better idea? Do we do more aggressive screening, less aggressive screening? And this was a really interesting uh, extension. It's an amazingly important problem in healthcare because now chronic conditions are super common. But when people develop guidelines, they rarely consider chronic conditions. You know, experts just focus on breast cancer. They ignore chronic conditions and they tell, I te I'm quoting from task force, you know, uh, statement, oh, patients with chronic conditions should consult with their doctors. Their doctors don't know what to do with them. You know, so that's why it's important to consider these chronic conditions in, in the guideline development. And this also, develop, you know, introduced some challenges because now we have to consider this changes in chronic conditions and changes in breast cancer risk. So it's like an POMDP embedded in an MDP and we solve them simultaneously. We found that this personalized screen policy is actually more crucial for women with diabetes. And secondly, we found that we should allocate less mammograms to women with diabetes despite the higher risks. But on the other hand, they should end screening at the later ages. So rather than like 40, 70 or 50, 74, their screenings are actually scheduled towards the end of their, you know, like screening uh, horizon. So those are some things that were laterally recognized by the medical community. And this is what we did in this study. Now, I want to also talk a little about like my double life, like my CISNET life. Like we look into this, uh, we use the simulation model. These are all simulation model applications. I'm talking about breast cancer applications. 
And we look into important policy decisions. I put some of them, but one of them is really recent. I really wanna mention in the next three, four minutes. We looked into the question of how do we do screening for women with Down syndrome? So two doctors from like two folks from Down syndrome medical interest group, a community, a society, they contacted NCI. And as they ask NCI, we have all these women with Down syndrome and we are we don't know what to do with them mammography screen because look into that their life expectancy compared to women without down syndrome is much lower many of them die between ages you know 50 to 65 due to you know uh, dementia alzheimer and other conditions yet guidelines say they should start screening at age 40 okay so so the question is do we do screening for them or not there is no data no trial no study and radiologists also don't want to you know um, aggressively screen these women because these women are very scared of mammography machine when they do biopsy, biopsy is complete anesthesia, not like local anesthesia. So it's, it's pretty painful. So these doctors uh, contacted NCI, NCI contacted us and I actually led this study. Uh, they said, okay, can you help these guys to develop a guideline for women with Down syndrome? Now, uh, and the other thing is <laughs> these studies show that the risk of breast cancer due to the genetic differences is lower, significantly lower for women with Down syndrome. So what we did is we said, okay, we ran our simulation model, adjusted all the inputs. In the end, we found that women with Down syndrome, they should not be undergoing any screening. And if they are gonna do screening, the best screening for them is just once at age 50. And this is really compared to test force, harm benefit ratios and so on and so. This is the way that we actually use simulation to I mean, unfortunately, we, I can never publish this in informed journals. Right? They won't publish a simulation model extension application to a cool problem. It has to be some innovative modeling. Really nothing innovative modeling here. We just changed the inputs. Of course, input estimation is challenging, but not really innovative. Uh, and then, you know, we publish this in a medical journal. Now, I want to also talk about two extensions of this POMDP framework to other cancers. The first one is colorectal cancer uh, that we published a paper in 2014, and we are working on extensions to that study too. Uh, one of them is, okay, we have this, and actually these two works studied at the same time. I had two PhD students, one studied on breast cancer, the other one focused on colorectal cancer. They were like quite independent, so it wasn't really affected. I was the only link between the two. And I think this was a cool problem too. The differences in colorectal, as we noticed, as we, as you know, I look, looked into POMDP is, you can't just use the same model for colorectal cancer. So for example, in CRC, there is adenomatous polyps. We don't have such state in breast cancer. Screening outcomes are different. And when you look into CRC screening, those guys already consider polypectomy history. So remember in my breast cancer model, I said, oh, once the patient got diagnosis, I am done. In CRC model, we couldn't make that assumption because that will be taking a step back compared to what the clinical domain knows about. And as a result, we came up with a completely different model. And, you know, yes, it's still POMDP, but if you look into the results, insights, everything is different. Of course, it's always a challenge when you write a paper, people are thinking, oh, Ozalog is so smart. There's like 15 cancers, right? One POMDP for one cancer, publishing another one and, and, and so on and so. It doesn't work that way, okay? So every disease, some diseases are similar. I'm not saying they're all different, but there are some real differences. And another perfect example is uh, Jacobus's paper, okay? Uh, and, uh, and as you can see, I put the journal name here. I don't put the journal name because then non-informed journal, which actually Jacobus, when came up with this idea, I mean, he came up with the idea, not me, three, four years, years ago when he was at Stanford, he's like, oh, you know, let's do this POMDP to lung cancer. That will be an amazing application. And I asked him, what is your target journal? And he said, okay, one OR journal and another clinical journal. I told him, you must be crazy to go to a clinical journal, but he did it after like three, four years. Uh, and when he started this lung cancer model, I remember we had this conversation. I told him, Yoko, I don't want to have another boring POMDP in lung cancer. But then it turns out that lung cancer model is actually even more complex because there is this something called smoking history and that is dynamic. Patients, they quit smoking, they start smoking, whether they quit smoking five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, those are all important factors. You can't develop a policy or a personalization without considering that. So now you have to have this like dynamic history of the smoking, which we didn't do, I didn't do in breast or colorectal models. And this is why it was quite challenging a different model. And, you know, uh, in a nutshell, the study uh, 
found that compared to the guidelines, you know, the POMDP suggests that they, we should extend coverage, uh, screening coverage to what we call ever smokers while reducing the number of screenings. So, uh, and again, I think this is probably the first such like POMDP work ever published in a really, and cancer is a very respectful, respected clinical journal, which means, you know, we, as a community, we can actually try, uh, shouldn't be hopeless and get this message out. So that's really my uh, the end slide. I know I'm like rushing, uh, nobody interrupted me. So, but I'm hoping that we will have some time uh, for questions and comments, but that's sort of my journey since sort of 2000, I would say six on uh, personalizing uh, or using stochastic models on oncology screening, disease screening and cancer screening. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm gonna just say this was Great talk, um, Oguz. I admire your effort, uh, I would say that, uh, and particularly trying to, this last slide that you shared, trying to get your work that's technical published in a medical journal. This is mostly, by the way, I want to take all the credit, but this is really Yakovos. I am just yeah. like the, that's okay, yeah. S still, still, yeah. because, um, to me, at least uh, uh, from a very personal perspective, that's important. And sometimes you put, put your foot down. You're gonna, I'm going to even try publishing it without any clinical authors. So sometimes you need to have clinical authors. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that uh, that's a longer journey. And yeah. we, we were burned many times early on. Um, we are, you know, you did a really effort-based uh, paper and community just trashes it right in the beginning because they don't they don't understand I mean, in the clinical community i mean yeah but but that's where you know keep trying you said five years right so that, that sometimes yeah. helps uh and i know it's not appreciated but many times within our community but i think as many of us grow in the space i think that's something we need to be um appreciating uh mm -hmm. at some point otherwise uh you know, we can just preach to the choir, which makes almost zero sense. I mean, again, this is my two cents. But that said, uh, I think we uh, we just want to have, uh, I, I guess, Iko was, uh, he acknowledged here, you. He said, we could not have done it without your help. So yeah, he's, he's, okay. uh, he's listening to you. Yeah, let's have uh, this discussion another time. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> so now uh, we got only five, six minutes till the till till the hour. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat so far. So there is a chat um, which may let you open. Let me see. I think I see one question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see one yeah. too. I think it just okay. popped up a little bit. So, I don't, uh, thank you, I don't, for your attendance. So, yeah, can adherence be somewhat independently predicted or is it very condition dependent? Uh, really, that's a really great uh, suggestion because when we looked into the adherence literature, there is a lot of literature on in medical studies on, you know, how do we, when we make this regular versus regular screen, people basically studied that. You can actually predict adherence independent of the condition. You can look into like if these women are showing you know, on time for their other physical appointments and so on. So that could be a proxy for whether they're gonna undergo mammography screening. But I will still say yes, there is a correlation. But uh, at least like for example, if I were to do colorectal cancer adherence, it is highly condition dependent because colonoscopy versus you know like if you do uh, mammography, they are very different. Colonoscopy, very invasive. Many patients feel uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, I don't really know the answer, to be honest. You know, like, can we independently predict? Again, many people in adherence literature, that is their idea that, oh, yeah, just looking into other behaviors and maybe education level, socioeconomic status, and so on. So we can predict adherence. And in my study, luckily I didn't have to deal with that. I just said, okay, this is what they report. We just reported the numbers, but really great question. Uh, we have a bunch now on the list here. Uh, do other summer gentry, um, uh, hello summer. Mm -hmm. um, again, the her question is, uh, do other researchers use your simulation models, Cisnet? No. Uh, and... no. <laughs> okay. 
And uh, oh. I guess there's a follow up. So let me just finish oh, okay. uh, for her. Um, what are the challenges of sharing those simulations across research groups? Is it open source? Um, there's always a struggle between privacy of medical data, but allowing scientific uh, reproducibility. Yes, so uh, first of all, especially after 2009, when we did the analysis for US preventative services test, or CISNET models became highly publicized. That was at the time of Obama healthcare reform plan. It was highly policy. This is how all those CNN articles, oh, these are the death panels, because we basically, not we, but the models recommended that it's okay to start screening at age 50 as opposed to 40. And then people are like, oh, see, this is what's going to happen if you limit resources. So the bottom line is after that, CISNET became so publicized that there was this sort of concern at NCI and CISNET that, you know, some of our models could be used for the purposes that we don't intend to use. And we have seen that. We have written some response articles. Sometimes authors, they look into our article. We presented some harms, benefits. They recalculated the numbers based on our models. And they said, okay, you know what? Here is what CISNET model says. And they make a completely opposite message than what we intend to do. And we wrote re response articles to that. So one concern at CISNET, NCI folks want us to reproduce or like to share our codes and everything, but they are not shared because the investigators are very concerned that, okay, even without sharing our codes, people are already using, misusing our numbers. What if we give our codes and then now people say, oh, I use the University of Wisconsin breast cancer simulation model. See, task force was wrong to recommend this. So that's why there is a resistance and, but I know that NCI is very unhappy when the investigators say, we don't wanna share our codes. So it's a huge deal. Reproducibility, we check it among the models because, you know, like within the models, we have a common, you know, uh, shared drive. We always compare our results to our early results. So like if a model is messes up, we can question within close model comparison. We have six models helps amazingly. If some model, let's say, makes a mistake or we are asking them why, you know, in your 2009 article, you reported this, but now you are reporting that. So that aspect, I'm not too worried, like scientific rigor and reproducible, because these are independent people. They are not my, yes, we write articles together, but we de independently developed our models. Uh, but if you ask me, is it ever going to happen that CISNET models are going to be shared online and people are going to use? I doubt. I mean, I hope it, we will come to that point, but there's a strong resistance here. Uh, we have two more, uh, uh, so and we can run longer. We don't have to end on time. So I've got thank thank you by the way, uh, August. I think that's a very pertinent and you know long answer, but but very relevant because there's a resistance of you know the issues uh, that are there. Um, now uh, the next question is thanks for your talk. Uh, do you consider a finite or infinite horizon problem for PUMDP? Finite horizon. And the reason for finite horizon, especially for older women, and believe me, every, I would say most of the cancer screening decisions, I don't know all of them, but they would require a finite horizon because for older patients, the real trade off is between that from non cancer causes versus that from cancer causes. And if you have this time dependent probability of that every year, so almost always you would have to go with a finite horizon model. I mean, yes, there could be creative ways of going infinite horizon. As a result, all of my POM DPs in this work and like any other work, it's all finite horizon. Oh, and, and that's really uh, relevant. So uh, by the way, I didn't introduce the question, person who asked the question, Yasin uh, Gakum. Oh, Yasin Goshkin. Okay, Yasin. Okay, Goshkin, Goshkin. Okay, sorry. I mean, you know, last okay. name is going to be hard, but Yasin, I think I've got pretty close. Um, I guess the next question uh, is again by uh, Aiden. I think it's a follow up to the previous question. Uh, and uh, Aiden, uh, again, saying thanks for your answer. Um, it would be interesting to untangle factors that are quote unquote independent across, and I guess across their meant. Uh, from the perspective of uh, mm -hmm. condition dependent question before? To be honest, in my opinion, this adherence issue in healthcare is like a career issue. You know, like somebody could build up a career on that. There are enough cool econometric applications, optimization applications, and so and so. 
I really looked into Atlas in a very simplistic way. I think Aydin makes an excellent point that really you can, and there is a lot of data. It's not like this is an, uh, and, and it affects everything, like whether it's cancer, Alzheimer, whatever you name it, every disease, adherence is a huge deal in this country and other. COVID, right? Like vaccine adherence, like people do not follow the guidelines. So, uh, you know, considering that, okay, maybe if in my community, people are not going to follow vaccination, maybe I should go with more strict social distancing measures or whatever, you know, like, so my point is, you know, these adherences across the diseases, not just cancer, other, and any of anybody, uh, you know, you can build your career on adherence. I think we need it. Now, I am not, to be honest, expert on that. I only use one, you know, for breast cancer adherence, whether women are adherent, regular or irregular, since that's it. My understanding is limited, so. Uh, there is actually a comment. I think this is from Shushi. Uh, Shushi, sorry. Uh, right? Uh, she is actually, uh, I think it's your comment, right? Shushi? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm yeah. So why, that... why don't you speak out aloud? I, 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 I should really not be speaking on your behalf. Oh, sure. So um, let me put the link here. So I'm um, just saying that uh, if someone is interested in the system model, there is a, uh, it's, it's online. So the, all the detailed model yeah. descriptions. I remember I spent uh, quite some time digging into those models and figure out how they build models. You can see even just for breast cancer model, there are six different models, six uh, uh, universities developing their own model. Each of them has detailed model description. Yeah. They have the mathematical definitions, uh, how they estimate the parameters, how they calibrate the models. So it's all the detailed so documentation. Actually, maybe I spoke your, thank you, Kish, you correct me. I spoke too negative on Cisnet because uh, we publish every detail. And actually yes. there is one model in Spain, a group of researchers, they replicated Dana Farber Cancer Institute breast cancer model. A company reproduced um, Carolyn Rutter's colorectal cancer uh, sim, uh, cisnet spin, uh, CRC spin model. So like there are actually so much information on cisnet website. If you put the time and energy, and these are very smart people, in a year or so, you can actually reproduce the model. So reproducibility, if you put the effort, is actually possible. So they are trying to be as transparent as possible. Right. So again, they are not like, and we are not like hiding our science or anything. It's just like, we don't want people to use our model and claim that I use the Cisnet model. But the way the information we put, and that's the reason 2018 special issue I edited. I mean, we had like 13 articles. We published everything about the models, all the parameters. We did some cross model comparisons, validation experiments. So I agree with you that it's not like we are avoiding or hiding. Uh, so, and if someone is really interested, you can really replicate some of these models. Happy to help you if you decide to choose one of the models. Yeah, I think this makes sense. The, the part that the misuse of the model you worry about is actually those who didn't look into the model details, but make this conclusion based on just a, a, to know the tip yeah. of the iceberg, right? If someone yeah. are really interested in this, they go, they spend efforts going through all the details, implement the model by themselves, they probably wouldn't make the wrong statements about the, the conclusion anyway. So. I mean, but you know, there is also like, especially industry, sometimes some of our papers hurt industry. So like, for um, example, I'm sure GE must have hated us when we oh, said yes. you don't need screening younger than 50. And now, and they have their own like modelers, by the way, disclosure, I am consultant with a medicine company on colorectal cancer screening. So my point is, you know, like, uh, this, yeah, for informed community, yeah, we, why would you be worried about people have this like scientific interest, but industry for them, it could be life and death. They could lose a lot of money. Yeah. And that's the other aspect. And uh, but let's talk about that another time. Yes. Okay. So I, I think we should end now. Uh, okay. We will have a few minutes past, but August, uh, again, unfortunately, Seth couldn't be here today. But on behalf of him, um, Kishi, and I think rest of Inform's leadership uh, in terms of uh, health application society, particularly. Um, Thank you again. I mean, you know, really thanks. Uh, this is a really fantastic talk. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And thanks everyone for your patience, attendance. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Everyone.